Welcome to this interview in the run-up to UICC's World Cancer Leaders Summit 2021. I'm Charles Goddard, I'm Editorial Director at The Economist Group, and it's really my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Rupa Dat, who is a renowned and passionate advocate uh, for gender equality and health, uh, global health, and redressing uh, the gender imbalance in global health leadership. Dr. Dat is a physician. Um, and is the co-founder of Women in Global Health, an NGO that works precisely uh, to address these issues. Uh, a warm welcome, uh, Dr. Dad. Thank you, Charles. It's great to be here with you. So I wanted to start really just by looking at this question of women's cancers um, and equity. Again, we, uh, we know the World Health Organization has uh, you know, set out in its recent initiatives, a global elimination, a strategy to eliminate uh, cervical cancer, as well as a global breast cancer initiative. Um, and I think the, f the focus on women's cancers is, is of course, extremely critical, um, not just because of the growing prevalence of those cancers, but also because of the great opportunity it presents to, to tackle cancers early on that can be really resolved uh, in many ways. Um, but in principle, does it also um, uh, send a really important, uh, a really important message about the value um, uh, of women in society, and particularly the value of women in and around health as well? Yeah. So, Charles, as as you said, you know, I am delighted to see that WHO has adopted a global strategy on the elimination of cervical cancer and breast cancer. Um, that has been. Um, in the works for a long time. And I really applaud the civil society advocates who have fought long to get non-communicable diseases onto the global health agenda. This is a work uh, of decades that we're starting to finally see um, the fruits of. Um, the burden of disease in most countries has already started to change and non-communicable diseases, including cancers, are the world's biggest killers, including for women. Um, ironically, it is also a system of our success that deaths of women in pregnancy and childbirth have significantly reduced, which is great. There's still work to be done on that. Um, and women are living long enough for cancers to be a priority. And just as we have succeeded to see a significant extent in tackling some infectious diseases, it's positive to see a global strategy focusing on action on cervical and breast cancer. And this means that we are starting to value the lives of women um, a lot more. And I agree with the points that you've mentioned there. So I think I mean, as you say, the message is quite, is very positive. I absolutely, absolutely agree. Yet arguably, of course, the global burden of uh, women's cancers remains really a very, very large unmet need. Uh, at this point, more than 2 million women a year develop uh, cervical cancer and breast cancer. And yet where they live largely determines the outcomes of that cancer, or indeed the fact that they actually get it in the first place. Um, how are you, first of all, optimistic that this very ambitious set of programs is going to be followed through? Because quite often these things uh, don't for you know don't work on the global public health agenda or uh, get pushed aside by other priorities. Um, and you know, what are the priorities in actually addressing those two cancers for those two women's cancers? Yeah, so, you know, Charles, the first thing is we need to have the values of equity hardwired into everything we're doing when it comes to um, any global health strategy, but especially when it comes to breast cancer, cervical cancer, we know it, it makes a difference which uh, community you're born into. So even if you're in a high income country, but you're from a marginalized community, a community that does not have um, access um, to health the way it ought to, you will see higher numbers of women having those cancers in later stages. So this one needs to be seen as a universal issue. Second, um, we really need to be looking at it from an equity perspective in every society. Um, and third, uh, we also really need to see, you know, the role that women will have. You know, too often women are portrayed as the vulnerable population, the target um, of these interventions. And we need to start bringing women in um, really as the change agents they are. They know exactly what their needs are and how to actually reach um, girls and women in their communities. And too often we have not practiced that in both global health and development. So that's a third aspect of this is really changing the narrative and seeing women as the ones that are uh, going to you know, deliver this care. And I'm very confident that it's going to be actually women that are going to 
hold to account the commitments that governments are making and health systems are making to this agenda. And that is um, why we must um, continue to invest in really women, particularly in this strategy. I mean, this idea of women as change agents as being empowered to take control of both their lives as well as the processes that are affecting them, uh, the health processes that are affecting them is, is really important. How do women uh, begin to take those steps and to begin to lead the health response to, to women's cancers? Yeah, so uh, excellent point there. And uh, particularly with women, we say women don't need to be empowered, they need to be enabled. Um, so in the current pandemic, we are seeing women leading at all levels, um, head of government responses, vaccine developers, delivering health systems and running community-based organizations. Um, they're providing practical support to people in need. Uh, some of the numbers to just put it out there, women are 70% of the health and care workforce, 90% of the nurses and community health workers. So they are already um, you know, working in our health systems and driving health delivery um, to everyone, not just women, but uh, our entire population. Um, and women are experts in the health systems they deliver. And without the work of women, uh, paid and unpaid work that they currently do, health systems would collapse. Uh, but what we do is we don't need to empower women, but we need to enable women. So an example is um, we don't really allow uh, women to be in equal numbers of leadership. Um, women are not participating in decision-making at the same level. Their talent and expertise is not making it into um, strategy development, decision-making. I mean, we're seeing this over and over again in, in the pandemic, but before the pandemic, when Women in Global Health was founded in 2015, we started doing a simple exercise of counting how many women are leading um, member state delegations or country delegations to assemblies such as the World Health Assembly. And we found only 23% of member state delegations were headed by women in 2015. We've been tracking that number and going back retroactively. And I can say it hasn't budged much, yet they make up 70 to 90% of the health response. And if we're not tapping into that decision-making um, and that expertise, we're losing out on it. And some of the examples um, I'd like to really highlight is first, we need to make sure that you know women's political decision-making from global to community level is happening. Um, and this is an example that I gave of uh, the fact that currently only a quarter of the chief delegates at the World Health Assembly um, are women. Uh, without women being in, in senior leadership, we're just not gonna see um, the ripple effect and the trickle down that's really needed. Uh, second, we currently see women are amongst the leading scientists. We know that science is um, critical to addressing cancers. It's been uh, an incredibly exciting decade or last two decades on the advancements in treating both um, breast cancer and cervical cancer and screening for it. And there's just so much that's happened, but we really need to make sure that women are represented um, as they ought to be in STEM. And currently they are underrepresented. They're often unsung heroines um, who don't win as many prizes or are not recognized in public health um, and other prestigious scientific awards. Um, yet we know even in COVID-19, many of the vaccines that have been developed are again from leading leading women. And uh, you know how many Marie Curies or female Einsteins are we losing right now in middle-income countries um, that could have led to scientific break that, breakthroughs for these cancers? So that's also part of changing the narrative. Um, and finally, as I've mentioned, women are the majority in the health and care workforce. They deliver health, um, but men are still the majority of the decision makers in health, which means that women's health priorities can be overlooked. Um, if you take a look at numbers on um, innovation in health or how much R&D um, budgets are given to women's health issues or even issues such as looking at testing itself, um, these numbers are, are so shocking. I have to say they drop you know, down to almost 10% and sometimes even 5% um, in, in budgetary or uh, representation, really an innovation of women um, in these fields. So we have a lot to do to really make sure that, again, women's health has a priority. And of course, as we talk about women's cancers here particularly, um, and women, uh, Healthcare workers are critical for reaching um, women with health information and services. We did a uh, recent report with a group called um, Foundation for Innovation and New Diagnostics, FIND, 
on women's access to diagnostic testing and why I pick up on that because this conversation about cancer and catching cancer early is critical to addressing um, and uh, improving um, just overall uh, life quality, mortality. And right now the testing included for screenings um, for diseases such as cancers, currently women are not getting equal access. And in our report, we see the barriers include financial, social, cultural. In many countries, women are still not able to um, you know, go to a physician and get cervical cancer screening done without the husband's permission. And um, you know that's you know why we need to have these uh, you know ecosystem type of um, approaches to these issues. So um, you know on that note, I'd like to really say we need to um, you know look at women as uh, already uh, empowered. They they want to take uh, more leadership in the health system. Um, they want the ability to be decision makers and drive um, change in the health systems. But also they need to be enabled, and we're just not doing enough of that um, in our work in society but also in our health systems. I mean, it was interesting, uh, you mentioned many of the discrepancies, uh, the dissonances that are there between uh, male, effectively male-centered health systems and uh, the needs of women um, uh, across the health system. And some of those came out quite well, have, are coming out quite well in the pandemic, aren't they? You're noticing that women have, uh, you know, particularly women who are working in, in the health uh, in the health field uh, have had problems with PPEs at the very least, um, problems with vaccines, problems with uh, equity of access, um, pay gaps, a whole range of different things that have come to the fore as a result of being highlighted effectively by you know by the pandemic now the, now that the spotlight is on is on the health system Yes, and um, Charles, you know, you bring up a lot of the issues we're advocating um, in COVID-19 is what we're calling for is a new social contract for women in the health and care workforce and um, many of the things that we are really talking about in this agenda is First, really making sure that we look at the leadership opportunities. So this point, um, women in many countries are a majority of the response in significant numbers. And in some places, most people will only have seen a woman health provider, community health worker in screening um, and treating and supporting COVID-19. Yet when you take a look at COVID-19 task teams, we did a um, study looking at a, over 100 and um, 15 task teams from around the world and found that 85% of those were majority men. So again, you know, seeing this underrepresentation of women in leadership in healthcare does have uh, a ripple effect. Um, we've seen examples of health systems being gender blind. So if, uh, one example is again, very linked to the conversation we're talking about what are considered essential services. And uh, a WHO survey early on had showed that um, from the services that were cut, 30% of those um, were in the family planning um, area. And we know that, you know, for screening um, cervical cancer and breast cancer, it's often similar providers that will catch these things. And we don't have the data exactly on um, how much um, of the screening has been missed out yet, but I know that that will be coming out soon. And so that's an example of if women were in decision-making, they would prioritize a women's health needs and not, you know, uh, imagine that pregnancy doesn't, you know, stop during a pandemic. Um, we're also really advocating for the women's underpaid and unpaid work. Uh, one shocking number, and um, I hope more and more people are aware of this, but half of what women do in the health sector, which is 1.5 trillion US dollars annually, is an unpaid work. It's informal, it doesn't get compensated, um, and that is a, a very significant number. If uh, anyone knows what you know, the standard GDPs of the top 20 countries are, you know, it falls within that range. And we are working to um, call all governments to start recognizing and formalizing the work that women do, bring them into the formal labor market. And every time you do that, uh, it results in economic growth and it also results in two to three other jobs being created. Um, we're also working on women's, um, particularly violence and sexual harassment piece and, and, and the part that you said about um, supporting women with, um, you know, PPE, personal protective equipment that actually fits women's bodies. Too often they're designed uh, for male bodies and, uh, and we're also advocating for vaccine equity because these are all issues that yes, it is a pandemic and that's why they're magnified, um, but they do exist um, at all times and that weakens our health systems and weakens our ability to achieve, um, especially the goals and strategies that we've um, set forward in cancer. 
Well, you, you've certainly answered my last question about what, what it is that women in global health are doing. And there's a, there's a whole range of things that you're doing. But can I just come back to the, uh, as a sort of final point, come back to this uh, question that you raised earlier about the health dividend. And I know you've spoken about this before. Um, and, uh, you know, how women take their place in the health system leadership um, having potentially a quite transformative effect, not just on the health system itself, but on potentially uh, other sectors as well, given the you know, extraordinary importance of health in our economies, particularly in developed economies. Um, what, what do you feel, what, first of all, what do you mean by the health dividend exactly by women uh, you know, help, helping to bring about a health dividend? And how can that be tr transformative in other sectors, do you think? Yeah, so uh, we, we call it the triple gender dividend, um, especially when women have decent, safe jobs in the health sector. And I'll unpack that a little bit. Um, so there's three parts to it. And the first part on health dividend is that we know that you know to achieve universal health coverage, we need to have health and care workers around the world. Currently, there's an estimate that there's going to be a 40 million um, health worker shortage. This is before the pandemic. Um, surveys that are coming out of most um, high-income countries are showing that fields like nursing are predicting that 20% of their nurses will drop out this year or next year. Um, and so without having our health workers who are majority women, uh, we're just not going to be able to achieve our universal health coverage agenda. And the health dividend is about making sure that we can uh, achieve all the health um, goals and um, the health related goals and the sustainable development um, goals agenda. And right now, if we don't have um, the health workers that are supported um, to be able to do their jobs and retaining um, them and bringing more in and investing in them, we're just not gonna be able to achieve that agenda. And then when you create a formal health job, um, often in um, health related sectors, um, looking at particularly education um, and also at, at other like tech um, sector as well, there's more jobs created um, for every health job. So every health worker needs to yeah, go through training, but also with um, the intersection with technology or transport sector, uh, we are seeing that that leads um, to what we call the economic um, return on the dividend. So that means that uh, we are seeing job creation overall and economic growth, not just within the health sector, but um, in other sectors around. And that leads to greater greater um, sustainability. And then also part of this is that um, uh, when women, uh, with the economic aspect of it, uh, when women have formal jobs and they have income, they're more likely to invest in their households, in their communities, um, especially for the health and education needs of their families and communities. And um, that leads to, again, the, the broader multiplier effect on, on health, um, but is part of the economic um, aspect of it too. And so um, this triple gender dividend is about health, it is about the economic aspect, and it's about the development aspect. And um, we really do see that unless we have decent jobs that are gender transformative, too often we like to have conversations about any workforce, but especially the health workforce um, as uh, gender blind. But if we acknowledge these are women and there are the inequities are facing or due to the fact that they're women um, and start actually addressing the root causes, we can create these decent jobs and really um, you know, see the benefits of this multiplier effect. Well, those are the arguments that we certainly love to hear at The Economist Group. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rupadat, uh, co-founder of um, Women in Global Health. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to speak to you. Thank you. It's been great to talk to you too, uh, as well, Charles, and uh, wishing everyone a wonderful conference. Thank you.